I thank you for being patient. Marion and Michael um, were generously meeting with our students for a pre-lecture seminar, so thank you for spending time with them. Uh, my name is Heather Roberge. I'm the chair of UCLA Architecture and Urban Design, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this year's Richard Weinstein Lecture. So the Richard Weinstein Lecture supports the invitation of practitioners from a variety of fields, those whose innovation and accomplishments have made significant impacts to architecture or urban design. This year's Weinstein speakers are Marion Weiss and Michael Manfredi. Their practice, Weiss Manfredi, is a multidisciplinary design firm in New York City known for its dynamic integration of architecture, art, infrastructure, and landscape design. Marian Weiss is the Graham Chair and Professor of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania's School of Design and has also taught studios at Harvard, Cornell, and Yale. Michael is Visiting Design Critic at Harvard University and has taught studios at Cornell, University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, and Yale. Together, they run Weiss Men Lady, and it, this is a practice that's, been, that's received numerous design awards, and both uh, Michael and Marion are fellows of the AIA and National Academy inductees. Their work has been recognized with the 2018 Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Architecture, the Academy Award for Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Architectural League's Emerging Voices Award, the New York AIA Gold Medal, and the list goes on. Together, their work exhibits many of the values that our former dean and colleague Richard Weinstein held dear. Their work is concerned with the urban, the infrastructural, and the social impacts of building and landscape. One of the things I find particularly remarkable is despite the increasing institutional scale of their work. It seems to always hold a humanist project close in mind. And when reviewing their work, I found that their project descriptions comfortably commingle terminology without regard to discipline. At the Kent State Center for Architecture and Environmental Design, they cite a feature associated with landscape to describe a transformative act of architectural organization. They describe an internalized esplanade that connects three studio trays and importantly academic divisions to foster, foster interdisciplinary collaboration. In both ambition and language, Kent State reveals the multidisciplinary nature of their practice. Their project for the Seattle Art Museum's Olympic Sculpture Park integrates art, architecture, and ecology in a new model for waterfront development. Their award-winning Hunters Point South Waterfront Park in, along the East River in New York weaves together infrastructure, landscape, and architecture into a model of urban ecology and a resilient, multi-layered cultural destination. The multidisciplinary nature of their practice is perfectly suited to the challenges of urban development today. Please join me in welcoming Marion and Michael. Thank you, Heather, for that uh, beautiful introduction. And I think. Uh, beautifully positioning what this lecture, the Richard Weinstein lecture, is bringing into focus, which for us is really recognizing that the kind of behind-the-scenes infrastructure and underpinnings of how we shape our cities and how architecture, in a sense, can give measure to those things have to be woven together by larger uh, logical, social, economic, uh, urban, and territorial questions. Um, and those territorial questions, we think, um, are incredibly interesting when we think about his uh, legacy impacting both the city of New York and the city of Los Angeles, and recognizing that the impacted territory of New York or the expansive territory of Los Angeles have different sets of opportunities, but leveraging larger behind-the-scenes forces first to impact that which gets 
impacted second uh, is remarkable and will play out in some of the discussions that we'll talk about this evening. Mm -hmm. So this is actually, uh, in, in preparing, I, I think, for this talk, we had an opportunity to kind of go back and uh, think about uh, Richard Weinstein's legacy, which uh, I think is unbelievably uh, prescient and um, very important to the uh, discussions today. Um, this is an image, uh, 1968, and it's unbelievably uh, both abstract but incredibly granular and local, and uh, the privileging of the streets as opposed to the building, um, make it actually not only a beautiful drawing, but a, a incontroversibly uh, part of New York. Um, similarly, we love the hybridization of the elevated number six line up in Harlem and uh, the sort of uh, the sense that you could piggyback a social and an infrastructural agenda without compromising either. So I, I think Back in '68, uh, perhaps um, the uh, legitimacy of urbanization and the foregrounding of it as an important discipline was nascent, but it's certainly uh, incredibly uh, relevant, and more so now that we're realizing that uh, between uh, too much fire, too much water, we as designers uh, are given an incredibly important opportunity to rethink uh, our uh, public realm. And I think part of the work that Richard uh, Weinstein pioneered was also, in some ways, debunked uh, the um, binary opposition of what's artificial and what's natural. And I think that was a very important contribution that is critical to certainly our own work. So one of the things that we are often thinking about is something, what's the larger territory of design? And our, our hunch is that the elasticity between disciplines was certainly apparent uh, centuries ago, and then it's since the bifurcation has pulled them further apart. And, and yet, what happens when we start to think about a utopian urbanism? Those utopias were often about fortifications that bound people together to keep the outsiders out, and that kind of cellular form that aggregated into isolation, no matter how large it got, had a kind of limitation. And yet you could start to think about these organizations of cities like Rome where tactical photographies were worked through, where Sixus of just was carving and shooting through the city to reconnect, destroy to reconnect through new infrastructure with fountains in many locations with pilgrimages and ease of connection. Something was happening that was interesting. But the other question, though, is what happens when you also look at something that is territorial, where it's a network? And in a sense, you could see Maki's diagram here of looking at architecture as a kind of network becomes an interesting type of infrastructure. Um, you could say that the kind of the kind of wet dream of what infrastructure could be at a larger scale as a kind of an inhabitable piece of magic was something that Corb certainly made very measurable. Um, and you could say that we've had our own kind of wet dreams about what uh, literally and figuratively you could do with infrastructure through a kind of multi-layered approach where you could actually have something aquatic and, and sort of slow and meditative superimposed over something high speed and wild. Um, these kind of preoccupations of ours have been ongoing and if you will the kind of leading connective tissue is this kind of uh, preoccupation with how we can make nature public and bring a kind of public dimension to the work that we're engaged in. And so we started to crack apart these questions of what might an evolutionary infrastructure look like, uh, and perhaps what a social infrastructure might look like, and how these could come together, and what terms and conditions would we give them. And we figured that we haven't been thinking about these things in isolation, so we gathered some colleagues and friends that we respect, and we started to tease out what these terms might be. And in effect, we find ourselves going back to People who thought boldly, like hanging with a mega structure in the whole, you know, rebuilding after World War uh, II with ideas of growth, not just sort of you know, rebuilding, but growth. And and then we actually were fortunate enough to be invited to the Venice Biennale this year to be able to create an environment where we could consider the terms of infrastructure through the lens of landscape and architecture. And what we wanted to do was unpack this as a true conversation and actually have one side maybe represent four of our own projects that are 
weaving between those kind of stercities of disciplines, but actually on the other side, the smaller section that you see here, uh, identify the questions that uh, the precedents that we've been mining for so long might reveal if we were to represent models drawn and formed in different ways. So rather than concealing our inspirational tracks, we actually wanted to create a room or a space to enjoy them as something that's more open-ended, so that there's a there there, but there's also a way in and a way out and a way through. So we're architects who like to make things, and we had the good fortune of working with a Venetian boat builder to uh, fabricate uh, these two conoidal uh, structures. I think the idea also was to kind of slice them so that there's a linear vitrine in a way that allows you both to look into this kind of magical world of projects that uh, we found inspiration from, but also once you're inside to look out and kind of capture the, um, the beauty of the Corderie, which are um, in a way a, 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 a factory, um, 14th century factory where uh, ropes were made. So it's an extremely uh, heroic scaled structure, um, and our sense was to try to make a bit of a, a cocoon that you could sort of slide through, around, and across. So uh, you can start to see how some of these projects, including, as you could see, Utsan's uh, Sydney Opera House, uh, some of the step wells in India that have been inspiration for us, kind of are captured in this kind of horizontal, quasi-chronological timeline. Um, and then um, uh, it, it's a chance also to kind of bring down a sort of sense of scale uh, when we talk about systemic ideas, but in the end, I think we also are deeply uh, enmeshed in the world of the haptic, the tactile. So that idea um, starts with uh, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, uh, a very small project that we are actually um, starting a kind of second phase. And here the idea was to create a visitor center, a kind of introduction to this magical place. It's only 56 acres, but it truly is a kind of a, an oasis in the middle of uh, New York City. Uh, rather than think of it as a singular building, we wanted to think of it as part of a, a kind of continuous uh, set of episodes or an episode on this continuous path. This path actually was designed rather beautifully by Olmsted um, and thought of uh, very much in a kind of cinematic, uh, cinematic term. So the idea of cinematography uh, plays out in... Uh, how our project evolved. And you can see that the sort of early charcoal sketch, uh, there's a sort of indeterminacy to how the building ends. Uh, and we very much wanted to continue to capture that. It's also the sense of um, play between city and garden. We didn't want to make a very clear distinction between one or the other, but to see those two worlds unfold and in a way intertwine. It's also resolutely a sectional building that at the lower end of the screen starts with Washington Street, a very active street in Brooklyn, and then in a way disappears into the existing topography of the garden. And we wanted to give that kind of uh, topographic idea measure. Um, and what started out as a simple kind of uh, sequential section MRI kind of drawing actually then became a set of bent steel moment cranes. So as you move through the building, you can register its uh, shift of the plan and section. So you start at the city, it's resolutely urban, it presents a plaza, an entry, and then the building sort of unfolds. It has a sort of, we hope, a somewhat seductive, seductive quality that never kind of completely reveals itself. You can never quite see the building in its entirety. At times it grades open, at times it continues in a kind of parallel path. Um, there are a number of event spaces, this being the kind of primary event. This is a sort of a, essentially a kind of a two-sided room uh, that kind of uh, unfolds and also reveals the sectional quality of the building. You can see the kind of clear story. So you slide through the building from both sides, seeing it from above, below, and across. And across becomes a really interesting intersection because at that point, we're really keen on the possibility of this building becoming equally a part of the garden as it is a part of the city. 
and this kind of green roof here, a 10,000 square foot experimental green roof for the garden becomes a new garden for them. Um, but also it allows us to create this inhabitable topography. We are up literally 14 feet above the main level of that space as you come in from the subway side and cross through the building. Uh, but as you slip by, you're also seeing the kind of uh, the leftover topography being more articulated, actually not in an organic fashion, but in a very orthogonal level to reach the uh, Ginkgo LA. But the question of being able to simultaneously be equal parts garden, equal parts architecture, is one where that idea of being able to mostly make your way into the garden and allow the building actually to be a subset of that narrative becomes pretty important. Um, but the, the idea of, it, of change and being very much um, part of the seasonal expression of the garden, being able to potentially host new ecologies becomes important. Um, the garden is very, very proud of being able to host these new ecologies in their, in their uh, green roof. They're less proud of this new ecology that's starting to actually impact the growth, um, but you could say that there is uh, maybe a kind of a, a resonance between this whole idea of evolution and change. But it really is one where at one moment you could say it's a kind of luminous lens and yet part of the conservatory language that's down at the other end of the garden, uh, but it's also something that has an indefinite sense of beginning and end of where it resides if we're approaching from the subway. Um, but the idea of being able to play hide and seek within a garden where the chapter of the Japanese garden is an important one to have uh, autonomy, you can see it whispering in the distance, or actually being robustly half city, half garden, half, half landscape, that kind of stretch becomes the, the ideal query. Um, but for us, it really is impossible to share these in slides because it is unfolding over 440 linear feet, a kind of experience of urban to garden. So we'll see if uh, you can sort of see the kind of invention of that, that green roof and the sense of passage is what we're hoping for a, a kind of simultaneous discovery. Michael described these kinds of inhabitable garden paths and the kind of temporal nature of life. Um, but uh, for us, it's the sense of being able to see a slice of inhabitable topography and yet be part of the garden became really a kind of invitation uh, for us to think. Mm. You think dynamically as a story for me? Thank you for that chameleon like change to the next project. Um, but the Barnard Fell at Diana Center is, is in many ways, uh, the the same, same kind of this kind of sibling, half 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 urban and half interior. Um, Barnard College, as you know, connected to Columbia University, both physically and um, and ideologically. It's still hidden, or was hidden, behind this big concrete wall, which was their student center on Broadway. The safest way to protect female students is obviously to make the student center out of 11 inches of concrete. Um, but nonetheless, when the due to secure the president said that we're going to turn this into a creative arts center. We had 110,000 square feet at stake on a tiny site, and our question was, well, what about the campus itself? Four and a half acres, you've got two tiny bits of greenery. What would happen if we could create a whole connected campus and not just one building? And so we actually looked at this kind of incredible problem of 100,000, 110,000 square feet, vertical building meant to have the kind of lateral peripheral vision that creative arts benefit from, how could we actually take the idea of connecting the whole landscape across those two old landscapes and also pull that idea up all the way through to actually create visibility within that structure? And so we kind of tried to distill it down to the essence of what we were trying to achieve, which you could see in this charcoal drawing uh, ascending up from the landscape into the landform of volumetrics of the building. Just so you know, you'll see a collection of charcoal drawings. You know, Michael and I both have discovered being equally left-handed and equally predisposed to the indeterminacy of charcoal. Um, you'll see that that's been our way of working for some time. Um, again, you see this uh, funny edge here of greeting for the uh, student center as it was. We use all that concrete for the lower two levels and kept the foundations, which is very useful, but actually started to look at the Tiffany window, what could be revealed on the campus, and also uh, tore out the bowling alley, which was underneath what we then turned into a green ascending terrace that would then connect and sit together the historic landscape and the contemporary landscape. You'll also see that the fire stair breaks out. We had such tiny footprints on that 
building that we felt that the fire stair could act like the kind of crisscross walk that you might see on a campus when you just tipped up vertically on this tiny site. But you could see the idea of actually compressing, even though they're acoustically separated by glass, they're visually connected, so that architecture, art, landscape, uh, and performing arts could be seen within eyesight of each other in this kind of compressed magic carpet, if you will. We're looking down on the library, down on the dining, down on the cafe, that all of these collapse together, create a sense of a, of a there there that is shared as opposed to totally independent. Well, the primary section uh, describes the whole building. We also try to kind of carve out uh, layers of intimacy, uh, more veiled views that uh, would counteract the kind of uh, large uh, volumetric view of the building. Uh, the building is clad in uh, 1,000, I think, 17 um, panels of glass, um, uh, unitized system, and uh, they tend to register uh, different orientations and different elements on the facade. Part of the, the kind of accident of sort of pulling charcoal uh, across a, a rough paper uh, gave us the idea or uh, intrigued us uh, in the sense of how could you capture a little bit of that in the context of uh, glass. So the glass is actually um, terracotta integrally uh, coated glass um, that is uh, uh, exterior acid ash and in places fritted. So it's a it's a play on the material of glass and um, tries to I think counteract the argument that glass is transparent and a non-material. Um, also, we discovered quite by accident that because the outer layer is somewhat translucent. Light will go through, hit a back pan that's about four inches away, and depending on the color of the back pan, light would bounce back out. So it would alternately shift from a kind of bright orange to a dark bronze, depending on the very simple shift in uh, chroma of the back pan. So at times, uh, this uh, building goes very, very kind of a dark bronzy color. At times, it's a very, very bright red. Um, often it plays with some of the chroma of the adjacent brick buildings. Um, but uh, we always uh, tend to think of it as part of this uh, fantastic uh, collection of buildings, particularly uh, the buildings on the right across Broadway. So there's a kind of dialogue between them. It's a historic core of Columbia campus, uh, Light, and uh, our much more modest version across the street. So, uh, moving from New York to Philadelphia, um, if some of you have uh, had an opportunity to walk from the train station to Myerson Hall or to the core, you'll kind of walk through a rather desolate uh, stretch of the campus, sort of a, a bit of a no man's land between the core campus and downtown Philadelphia. And what was intriguing to us was the sense that Penn's unbelievably prescient plan could somehow uh, translate and inform a, a very specific lab building, which, uh, as many of you know, generally tend to not be very urban. Um, so the idea you can see in, in the making of that kind of little red object was to create a kind of courtyard or another quad that would somehow start in a very modest way to mediate between Penn's campus and the Penn plan of Philadelphia. It's a, it's a kind of a three-dimensional uh, bit of a, a Mobius uh, that creates a courtyard. Um, but it also allowed us to kind of think of the topography of the building as one in which you could slide from an external landscape up through and see research through the kind of uh, lens of circulation and then finally ascend. So uh, here you see the building uh, as it opened about four years ago. Uh, the landscape, the black locust trees, which are characteristic, have since really uh, come into their own. But the, the, the kind of mediating space is truly public, and this was something actually that um, Penn was very interested in, in the way they wanted to show off a lab, but it's also an opportunity to think of this building as having a much more public agenda. So this lobby is truly public. And what's interesting, uh, was interesting to us, was that 
the glass that's required to mitigate some harmful UV rays when you're creating or working at the scale of nanotechnology is also a very, very beautiful uh, saffron colored glass. So that became, in a way, the kind of marker or the iconography of the primary public spaces, but also it was an opportunity actually to bring some natural light, albeit very filtered, into lab areas. And folks who work in these lab areas very much need to kind of get a little bit of distance to be able to look out windows because you're working in a bunny suit for up to 12 hours. So you can look through and see the sort of space. And I think the, the looking through that Michael talked about, the bunny suit world, which is on, on your right with the amber, the amber glass, is one where actually right next to the edge, covering up and slipping up all the floors of the building, is this kind of inhabitable walkway. Um, and just to speak to that a little bit further, we had this kind of a challenge with the lab building, which is electromagnetic interference and vibration interference are counter to the kind of productivity of the instruments that have been used there. As a result, the elevators need to be in the most remote corners of the building so the laboratory work can succeed. Our client, Eduardo Glantz, said, um, you must build the most irresistible stair because they must use the stair and the elevators are not nearby. So it's, we, we basically said, you know, if we could actually widen them a little bit more, we can create these kind of collaborative landings because, in fact, it's a 20-foot floor to floor, not 12 feet or 14, 20 feet per lab floor. Um, in fact, you can even see down to the lower level up to the other. It works very well. Um, but more importantly, we wanted to um, build on their query about how the kind of, it's the first uh, cross-disciplinary engineering and arts and sciences building purpose-built on the campus, how could these different disciplines be disputed and isolated each other? How can personal vision encourage them to actually have a conversation? And ultimately, um, ironically, having the conversation at the top of the castle rather than the bottom between the place for convening is only because the own space that didn't have vibration criteria was indeed the data own space. So it's up there with a, a very large cantilever, but a very intimate space up in the sky so that they can actually have a place to overlook the campus and the city when they're having conferences and dialogues, but also make their way onto a green roof. Um, that query, though, is really interesting because by doing so, we were able to free up the land so that we could actually create a new garden or green space, much like the rest of the campus. Um, and that green space, and in a sense, the kind of wonderful gift of that amber glass created this uh, glowing golden uh, crystal in the middle of the opaque world of engineering. Um, but for us, it really is a kind of a gift, um, and I'm going to try this again, of movement. Um, and again, we'll see if I can get to the next one after this. But, um, but what you can start to see is with the 68 foot cantilever and also the kind of unfolding of the space inside, people are drawn both in, into the labs and out of the labs. Um, but people are also able to recognize that this is a, a protagonist within the city itself. So we'll see if I can make it, but I might ask for my rest in the computer from the end of one. Um, to the next one. Um, so that gets to uh, the project that Heather mentioned, which is the, the Kent State Center for Architecture and Environmental Design. And what could be more sobering than being asked to do this kind of a project? <coughs> we teach in it, we work, learned in it. Um, but one of the things that was so intriguing about the co competition was that they basically said, look, we've got something to do here with our building. We are trying to marry a relationship between Kent State and the partnership with Kent itself. So what would happen if this could be invested in? It made the New York Times that this uh, ambition was on, and you could see to the left the town, to the right, the university, and they said, can you build a building that will connect our, our, our terrains together? And we thought that was a long shot of a, a question, but what if we could actually imagine a kind of lens that opened up from the academy to the city and just tip the building a little bit, stretch it as far as possible so that it could, in its 300 feet, begin to merge that. But the other question, though, was if there is indeed an esplanade along the way that connects city and the academy together, could that esplanade also make its way up and through the design studios that actually are going to be alive 24 hours, unlike many, many other places on campus? So this continuous studio loft then sets up um, this kind of layer cake, if you will, that ascends to the highest edge, which is where the tall buildings are in the city, and descends to the height of the buildings on the rest of the campus on your left, 
construct across and leverage for section. Um, but it really is an, an incredibly simple diagram, um, but also an incredible way to stretch the site and actually stretch the diagram of their esplanade that they had already built, like courtesy of uh, earlier design. Um, but what you can start to see here, though, is this invitation to come up and ascend and make your way into the studio space is also looking straight down to the channel where the library um, and the event space are. Um, this is looking uh, both down to the main level, but also into the studio. You can start to get the sense of this northern light being an incredible gift. It's the first time we've actually been oriented in the way we wanted to be oriented on a building. Um, but you can start to see this compression. This, is, this was the first day where they said, no computers bring out your, your green Borco, and we thought that this was a marvelous time warp um, for the start of school, but you can start to see this kind of collapsing view, and up on the left you see the critique spaces, so that all the reviews are sort of within eyesight of, um, although they're physically distinct from the studio space. Um, looking down, first year student, her top, you know, carefully matching the green Borco, looking down, and you can see this is what the infancy at the beginning look like, although it's looking very different now. We actually like the mess uh, on the right, which probably occurred two days after uh, the, uh, the building opened up. But I, I think also um, those of us uh, in this room who are in an architecture school, those of us who teach, know that lateral, lateral learning is actually the most significant. So the hope is that you're always seeing and being seen sharing your work, you're part of a much larger community. And similarly, uh, the hope is that that community could be stimulated by some of the work they see being created. Uh, the most public part of the building uh, is actually the library, which is located closest to the town. So there's another uh, entry. And uh, the idea of making this as a kind of little building within a building allows the view of the library to kind of be framed up as an almost autonomous part or object within the building. Uh, but it was also our intent to kind of think of these multiple scales. Kent is an amazing small town that's urbanizing at a very, very fast rate. And what's particularly interesting is the kind of shift of scale and materials that you see here. Very, very simple um, domestic uh, wood frame structures to larger brick buildings. And we were intrigued with the idea of brick um, this part of Ohio was home to probably several dozen uh, brick manufacturing plants. There are sadly only several left. So uh, we worked very closely with Belden Brick in a way to resurrect uh, an old beehive kiln that uh, they were ready to take down and demolish. And when you create brick in a beehive kiln, one of the characteristics is the incredible range, a chromatic range which is often seen uh, as a pejorative. So you see this uh, beautiful structure, and what really intrigued us was the shift in color, but also the tactility of the brick. And some of that is a function of the specially extruded bullnose brick, but also each brick has a slightly different chroma and uh, a different sort of sense of touch. So you can start to see the kind of combination of brick and glass, this kind of big, um, in a way, um, glass uh, kind of greenhouse-like structures, very simple actually, very inexpensive position on a simple brick base. Um, the building is often seen on the oblique. We like the way these kind of blue monitors tend to kind of collapse. Um, this is a very recent uh, building, a tech center for Cornell Tech. Um, uh, it's called the Tata Center, uh, named after the um, Indian company that um, is very interested in this particular project on Roosevelt Island, which is uh, uh, in a way an anomaly. Uh, very few islands uh, in the middle of cities. Um, and this is a, an incredibly magical place with very different prospects. Um, Manhattan, Queens, very different kinds of views, but also, as we talked about earlier, uh, an area incredibly prone to flooding, as uh, was the case during Hurricane Sandy. Um, we were given a, a rather lumpen, uh, fat site. You can see the dimensions uh, were almost square. And the first thing we did was to try to reconfigure that site to take advantage of the opportunity of being on an island and having two views. The building is split in 
into prisms. Those prisms essentially are carved so that rather than four corners, you have eight, and you have an opportunity to engage a smaller number of companies and occupants so that the sort of sense of scale of the building is uh, in a way democratized. Uh, but also the section, the section's played so there's a kind of piano nobile that recognizes the um, inevitability of flooding on this island uh, and the inevitability of flooding in the whole New York region. So um, it's a building that, like uh, Kent, is resolutely sectional. Uh, so you traverse off of a kind of a uh, public uh, street into a piano nobile and then finally up on the roof. The building on the right uh, was uh, or is uh, Tom Main's uh, Bloomberg Center. So there's a kind of a, a dialogue that these two buildings play with each other. And then um, you can start to see there's a kind of large oval uh, that's been defined as the sort of uh, the point at which several buildings will start to cluster as the campus is developed. But we we're also very intrigued with the kind of play of uh, the kind of speculative quality of the mullions so that they could pick up and intensify the quality of light over the course of the day. And similarly, uh, that sense of change is played out as the building uh, is seen from different orientations. But, you know, the, the, the idea of splitting the building, though, was very important in part because we had this opportunity to have river-to-river -river views, but we also were given a very awkward lump in sight for a kind of a building that was neither too tall or too short. By dividing it, though, most importantly, that open green that Michael described was also something that could pull all the way up and through the building. And in so doing, we were working with a field operations landscape architect for the master. They were doing a campus overall landscape. So we were able to actually extend from that language to carry a new ascending terrace to sort of exceed our FEMA limits, and also come into this kind of conservatory greenhouse, which then takes us to the center point, which is almost what we call the kind of steps of Roosevelt Island, or stretch maybe. Um, but um, the point, though, is that you could be able to see, stand here and look right across the river. I mean, we're literally at the narrow point here where we can almost touch the water on both sides. Um, and be invited to look into the kind of master studios. And I think one of the more important things is to say that this is um, a multidisciplinary tech campus that one-third is for the academics, but two-thirds is for entrepreneurs. So this is the kind of funded and unfunded cohorts coming together. So to have a two-story studio here, which has shared breakout spaces that look out over over this island and onto Manhattan is really a spectacular kind of setting to have informal conversations. And these stairs that now take you up to the kind of funded entre entrepreneurs who inhabit the upper floors of the building. But again, we're generous, you see, massively inefficient around the kind of circulation areas to set up the possibilities for these kinds of meetups and conversations. Um, sustainability is very much a priority on that campus. Tom's building is just an exceedingly uh, beautiful demonstration of platinum. Um, our building is actually 60% opaque, 40% transparent, although through its crystalline language looks as if it's a lot more transparent. But you can see this idea of lofting the structure and still packing an enormous amount of insulation. Um, and then we also have this wonderful, I would say, ongoing collaboration with Tom's building, in part because the 22,000 square foot solar canopy that's sheltering this rooftop terrace contributes the energy to the Bloomberg Center to allow it to be net zero. So this kind of idea of a kind of campus collaboration only got us to lead goal, but that's all right. We're not sensitive about it. But um, but in any case, so the idea of... Uh, Still waiting for payback. <laughs> but the idea is something that is really not just about the kind of uh, the constellation of collaboration that Cornell Tech and uh, Mayor Bloomberg at the time were really trying to foment on this island, but also recognizing it as a constituent of the city is, is something that we're very excited about. Um, which leads us to being a constituent of another city in another place. So this is very much a work in progress. We kind of feel like students presenting to uh, a distinguished jury, so you'll have to be patient with us. Um, Delhi is an incredible city in an incredible country. And I think the sort of sense of language of both architecture and landscape uh, have been uh, inspiration for the last uh, 20, 25 years. Um, we were very fortunate, or are very fortunate, uh, to work on the campus uh, where Edward Durrell Stone did this very beautiful chancery. And part of the goal of this uh, project 
is to build a set of buildings adjacent to it so that this will be saved and ultimately restored. There's a moment when the State Department thought of tearing this down, which is unbelievable. Um, but it's also a, a part of a embassy campus or compound that has an incredible legacy and is completely intertwined with India's nascent um, development as a great democracy. Um, and uh, this was our client, so I, I think I can linger on this for a few moments uh, and uh, be somewhat wistful. Um, but it's also, uh, we started with this idea of, rather than I think of uh, three buildings, four buildings, think of this as a kind of a, a connective, a sort of a, a tapis vert, a green carpet that first and foremost connects existing and new buildings. Uh, so you'll see the ultimate build out. 50% of these buildings are existing and will be restored. It's also a project about walls, which are important to uh, traditional Mughal architecture, um, but also a sense of layering, a kind of a sequence from public to much more private, an idea of playing with vertical uh, and horizontal planes to affect a slightly sort of synchronized idea about topography. So the ceremonial route. Um, is uh, first introduced under uh, a canopy of Alonix trees, where you see our addition and then the Edward Wellstone uh, building on the right. Uh, we've pushed our building back so that the Edward Wellstone is the kind of primary initial protagonist. Um, but it's also about taking an extraordinarily large amount of square footage and, um, and essentially carving it into the ground plane, which is actually um, a very typical uh, Indian way of developing it. If you've been to Public Secret, the kind of modulation of the ground plane is exquisite. Um, so there's a sense of a series of wells that both collect water and bring light below. Um, and it's also an opportunity for us to keep this building a little bit lower than the other wellstone uh, masterpiece. It's also an opportunity to play with the kind of incredibly bright light that is so typical. Delhi. The sun is almost always overhead. Uh, it's very, very hot. It's also an opportunity to collect rain. Um, and you can start to see in the development of the facade uh, an idea of uh, mitigating this bright light as you move through the space. The buildings are folded slightly so that there's always a sense of seeing what on the oblique. And the oblique and the kind of protection from the sun was something that we were actually really intrigued on the Edward de Relstone uh, Chancery Building with both his sort of engagement to tropical modernist sort of statement of screens, uh, but also the kind of stacking of columns. It's an interesting combination, but apparently quite awful to be in those offices and not to be able to see out. So we wondered what would happen if we started to hybridize the language of columns and a screen to create something that could both screen but also offer optics out and deal with the kind of uh, sun shading uh, without the kind of full over cladding of the building. And that uh, was a series of exercises that were also simultaneously, on one hand, sort of going through incredible uh, strong programming for the sun shading, but also doing our studies in charcoal of what it would be to have some areas that are fully clad in drum-like uh, stone uh, sort of drum with a canopy sheltering the arrival so that we could actually uh, take advantage of this uh, language and dialogue with both the kind of canopy and the kind of screens that we saw that would be real stone, but something deeper in the history. Um, but also carving in, again, you could see that lower level. We have probably 30% of the program of this building is underground and under the green uh, to keep the building in scale. Um, you can start to see it here, though, uh, that idea of being in full dialogue with the other buildings on the campus, including the, the uh, ambassador's residence in the distance, um, turning around to see the arrival. Again, there are checks and thresholds. But more importantly, too, the idea that water, which had been used just as an honorific circular reflecting pool in front of the uh, Edward Wilson and Chancery, we wanted to kind of invert that question and go actually deeper, maybe towards the possibility that the water here could be experiential and evaporative cooling plus the shade of the canopy might make the arrivals uh, become very different and yet still keep an honorific identity. Um, so security is sort of on our mind, and you could say that a tiny little project here in the Barnes Visitor Center, the big security issue since pharmaceuticals have such uh, challenges keeping uh, their things uh, private that they need to keep private, and 
and yet still welcoming people. We were tasked with the tiniest project on that campus, this was headquarters in North America, to actually create something that wasn't just going to be the security booth, which they had, but actually create a visitor reception building. Um, tiny building, large landscape. So our query was how could we actually shear, thicken a wall, and recognize the fact that this had formerly been a fence and guard booth, and if that fence could actually, and the booth could be broken open to become embedded in the landscape, we could actually start to see something that would create a kind of transparency, really figuratively on what they do on that campus, give you that kind of, you could call the pur purgatory space at the threshold, air side, you know, and land side. Um, but this is the place where you are either allowed to go onto the campus and greet it and escort it or not. Um, but once you get through that threshold, you're actually able to look out onto this garden and shows that you're truly on the campus side. Um, and from there, you'll pick up and shovel and brought onto campus. And that idea then of the fence is very real. The requirements were very strict. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot at stake in keeping uh, what's going on in there uh, private. Um, and yet the idea that they had of saying that we still want to be a luminous welcome uh, to people who need to know about our company or are coming here, and so this idea of this tiny building sort of stretching across and becoming an emblem for that gateway um, was a great task for us to sort of put security on its head and into the earth. Um, so that takes us to another earthbound project, the Olympic Sculpture Park, one that some of you may know is sort of this funny condition at the edge of uh, what's being found. And, and yet you could see this location on the waterfront in Seattle when people said, oh, we're on the waterfront, we thought, great until the competition said, oh, it's not really one side, it's three, and we'd like to actually have three separate parcels, hire two artists to do fabulous infrastructural bridges, um, but please do a competition entry that suggests what you think is at hand. And our query was looking at the failing seawall, the four-lane highway, the train tracks, um, the contaminated site, uh, that maybe we could actually think of something that would allow one continuous landform to bring into focus all these divided territories into one. And it really was this question of a kind of a, an infrastructure x-ray that we started to interrogate um, to simultaneously think about how could we actually connect everything, keep the trains going, keep the cars going, um, keep the excitement of all these things going on simultaneously, and perhaps create some salmon hope. Um, so how do you in nine acres deal with all these systems, all these agencies, all these approvals, um, and actually integrate infrastructure in a way that actually can be superimposed and woven within it? These systems then, we actually started, as Michael sort of described in the Botanic Garden project, we actually created this kind of systemic shearing um, that would allow a chameleon-like presence of urbanity on one edge and a whisper that went underwater into the tidelands to the water. Um, 200,000 cubic yards of earth we were fortunate to get because with downtown a mile away, the museum was excavating for their new museum expansion downtown, so we got all that earth for free. Um, and then we were able to kind of do the zigzag and construct this earthwork that would actually um, come down to the wall. We originally had a cord in place concrete walls, an idea. We were just crazy over budget just for the walls alone, exceeding the total budget of the project. So our engineers suggested, why don't we do something as simple as the highway building earthworks, which are the Gabion walls here that you see, MSC, Mechanical Stabilized Earth. And on top of that, because of the seismic activity, we put these precast concrete walls that overlap each other without cracking so that you could actually get your natural 42-inch high guardrail in one move all trucked down from Canada. But what you can start to see is that kind of cladding then sets up an abstraction that allows the vista, of, in this case the Calder and, the, and the, the, um, the Olympic Mountains in the distance, hence the name of the park, um, to come into simultaneous focus, the kind of slaloming of movement compressed and condensed, uh, both on the earthwork and the building work, and the kind of wandering down, literally being a kind of a topical change seasonally, so that what is brown there is brown in one season and green in another season. So it is both artificial and natural every step of the way, where you can start to see, in fact, this is that incline up uh, the hill. The building takes advantage of that to provide a kind of parking entry below and a kind of, kind of framework above. And that shearing again allows a kind of window out to the lens of the park and a window into the lens of art. You can see Pedro Ray's uh, incredible piece here and his cupolas uh, suspended looking out over the bay. And then the idea of even being on the street, if you're a cab driver, you can look all the way through the building. There's a six-foot cut that strikes the whole course of the building and looks all the way out. 
Um, but in fact, it's not just the cuts through the architecture, but the cuts through the land. In this case, actually creating a valley that would allow Richard Serra's incredible piece, Wake, to actually have a home and also be the top of that piece at 17 feet high would be a dead on flat with the uh, street above and also the wall above. Actually, it was an incredible opportunity to work with Richard Serra, who is uh, a very, very sophisticated sense of space and scale. So, as Marion said, the top of these uh, complex uh, uh, five figures aligns with the street, so you get a gauge both in terms of section but also plan. The other thing that was very important to him and, and to us was the interplay between the straight lines and the curvilinear forms. Uh, Richard was really emphatic that those be straight lines. Um, he may not have been so emphatic. We <laughs> joke, we sent him this image, we said they're all bowing down to his sculpture. <laughs> I think he liked that, um, but uh, sometimes uh, things happen that are quite wonderful and uh, surprising. Uh, we never anticipated yoga in the context of art and ecology. Um, but as Marion said, the park wanders from the city to the water's edge. Here you see it in Juan Bon's photo as it sort of collapses itself um, over the highway, um, so that at one point the highway essentially disappears. Um, we're standing dead center on uh, Elliott Avenue, which is one of the primary arteries north-south. Uh, then it slides over the train tracks in the upper left, uh, so it becomes overtly bridge-like. You can see they're kind of sliding over Elliott. And then uh, this piece also allowed us to collaborate with Teresita Fernandez to do this very beautiful Seattle cloud cover uh, fence, throw fence, so the play of light uh, against uh, the precast is uh, serendipitous and quite magical. Uh, the idea also of thinking about art in new ways, uh, Mark Dion's piece, which is the greenhouse, uh, houses uh, a 80-foot long log. Uh, but I think the one area that we've been most proud of, and we've now gone back twice to uh, monitor this uh, over the 10 years uh, when the first phase of the park opened, is the waterfront is truly public, um, and it was a chance to rebuild a failing seawall and to engineer a beach. There's nothing actually um, natural about what you see. We worked very closely with a series of hydrological uh, engineers to construct the right um, shape, and uh, fortunately nature um, came along, a big storm, and dumped uh, about 100 logs onto the beach, um, and we were the beneficiaries of, uh, uh, of uh, another designer uh, in a way that was a mark. Oh, but we've now come back, and uh, Wash U is checking salmon habitat, so it's very interesting to see that uh, juvenile salmon do like well-designed places, um, so we're happy about that. So this was a park uh, 10 years ago, actually, on opening day. This is our last project, um, and um, uh, this also is a very slow project. It's uh, an urban park uh, on New York's East River uh, with, in a way, close proximity to a number of uh, important and very visible uh, structures and buildings. You can see the site here. Um, uh, here's a close-up uh, just before uh, we started work. It was an industrial site. Uh, a site with multiple histories. Many of you know that this part of Queens was covered with uh, an incredibly productive wetland uh, back in pre-colonial areas, and then, like many urban areas, it was transformed and retransformed in 2012. But the idea is that um, the park, in a way, sets up uh, future development. So while we're not uh, the authors of the development, uh, we have authored a series of corridors that tie the water's edge back into uh, Queens itself. And you can see these different layers. It's also, I think, this image makes the point that this waterfront is nothing natural about New York City's waterfront, as you can see here. So, in, in a way, we inherited a very idiosyncratic edge, <clears throat> which we quite liked, um, in a way, like charms on a necklace. Each little piece had its own identity that we really wanted to intensify. Uh, but it was also 
free, uh, I guess, resilient thinking. Um, so the idea was actually to create a waterfront that was both hard and soft, so that in the event of a very large storm, <clears throat> excuse me, we could absorb water. Marion will share an image of the little island that gets created as a sort of essentially a new island, depending on both the storm surge, but also tides. So a sort of sense of metering over the course of the day and using that meter, the tidal meter, to change the shape. So here, this was a very provocative drawing. Um, we were not allowed to share this publicly. But what it is is a giant cistern that can absorb uh, water. So on Hurricane, Hurricane Sandy came, it absorbed the water, contained it, and then we were slowly able to drain it out. Uh, but also as a place, um, I think this is the Bernie Sanders rally, I think um, makes a convincing argument that the digital field and the physical field in the creation of public space mutually support each other. So this was an event that happened uh, very quickly over the course of about 12 hours. Um, but like many of our projects, we're interested in a kind of sequential nature and the way of taking a, a, a kind of an architectural object and stretching it as far as it could possibly stretch. So here you see the kind of canopy, which is also a ferry stop. And that canopy is hardworking. It collects water. So the park is essentially net zero, but also um, allows us to collect uh, through uh, solar power, uh, collect electricity to power the park. And this kind of idea of collection actually comes into focus that, that what is effectively the kind of retention and release basin uh, that works during kind of flood conditions is also, generally speaking, it's a playing field for the school across the street, it's a new school. Um, kind of intriguing discussion. Uh, you'll see in this diagram that it looks perfectly green. Uh, initially, we just had one oval turf green. Parks Department said it's got to be artificial turf. Uh, the Arts Commission said that it had to be all natural turf. They drew a diagram for us of a rectangular artificial turf within the oval itself with leftover bits of green grass on the edges. And we thought, wow, that's why um, we're the designers and we should have a conversation. So we did, and we actually created uh, a, 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 an artificial turf oval, oval for the playing field and the topographic crescent of green. Um, but what became interesting is that on the other side, there was also the history of water taxi beach, um, which was lost. And so we actually reestablished a new beach um, as we moved south on the other side of the uh, pavilion. You could start to see looking through it the right place. But there were also prior luggage. This was a kind of industrial site. It was for the rail for the the boats and the roads could actually exchange, and so this rail was where goods were transferred. And so by rejuvenating the idea of those rails to have a new life, uh, we were able to kind of bring a, a kind of a second dimension of past and present together. So we'll try to reveal a little bit more about what happens uh, on a summer day. That This is a shade pavilion, a concession building, restrooms, and a maintenance building. They had originally asked for four separate buildings, and we said, wow, Maybe we could do it in one. So what you start to see there is that kind of unfolding of one slender building of maintenance all the way to the other one. The, the, the rail becomes more important, I think, for kids to actually use as a balance beam than the gardeners who like to look after it. So what we find interesting is that that was really the phase one, concentrated dense, playground, dog run, you know, all the kinds of things that we could do on the flat. But what we found in phase two, which we just completed and just opened, um, was that it was topographically diverse, so topographically diverse that we really couldn't have organized sports. That was our fabulous gift. But we also were told if we could level it, then they could get everything worked out. And we said, well, maybe we don't want to level it. Maybe we'll have a double level park come to life. So the question was, could we actually take the top level and use it as an, a way to actually come closer to the city and reach out? Uh, which is overlooking here, and can we also take the lower level and actually find that as we're trying to create new wetlands habitat, get ourselves closer to the edge and, and actually experience this bi-level world. So you can start to see that that um, was easier said than done. We only showed as long as possible just line drawings. You know, people don't suspect anything when, when they're on the engineer's drawings. Um, and so this really was a massive installation here, fabricated in Maine, and then uh, craned in the course of just a couple of hours um, onto the point that had been built. Um, it uses simple boat technology. Those are metal panels, uh, auto body paint, um, but it cantilevers over the new wetlands. 
Um, and if you look at the wetlands to the south, it really has a kind of a barely there kind of quality. Um, but those wetlands are the more important bit. We were allowed to build one acre of wetlands if we could protect it, and if we sort of put it on the edge and just didn't protect it, it would be washed out. So this new idea of actually creating a gift of fortification came into way, and I'll talk about that in a moment. It's also, though, about creating new social infrastructures and biking infrastructures that didn't exist. Um, and those lead to this sense coming in, coming at it from the north, at this sense of either being able to head out to look out at the city or go down to the four-foot path. You see that kind of fortification, the kind of rift on castle fortifications is not a coincidence, um, but it also sets off different views. It really is an, uh, a kind of a berm that protects that wetland, allows the tidal variation gets full up twice a day and empty twice a day. Um, but it really gives you a sense of walking on water, which is what's so magical because most waterfront parks in New York are on edges. Um, and those places sometimes introduce a place for two people, or in the case of these exercise terraces, multiple people stepping up. Um, but back to the island that we were able to release from the, that land mass, you can make your way across this bridge, across the wetland, to a place of incredible sort of spectacle and kind of quiet and, and scene that's unseen before. Um, and at dusk, really, the city comes alive, and so does the, the kind of park itself. Um, in fact, it's all about leveraging something that's far larger than the kind of finite nature of the architecture or the landscape, but actually locking up and, and leveraging the idea of a kind of a section that's obvious in the water. So we'll return to, I think, uh, Richard Weinstein's legacy. Um, and it's our hope to bring into focus architecture's capacity to mediate between the generous, the general, and the specific, and to transcend the divisions between social, cultural, and ecological identities. Thank you. Thanks for the lecture. It was very generous of you to um, bring Richard Weinstein back to us all and have us think about him again. Um, and it was also really refreshing, I think, to see a series of projects that you describe in really straightforward terms so that we start to see them as, like, uh, I don't know, a series of problems that have interesting solutions, and then we make the connections in a way between them. One of the things that it made me think of is that I think Richard imagined his work in New York as kind of building an infrastructure that architecture would then populate. Um, and the infrastructure was a background piece. And it seems to me that um, your architecture is really, I think you used the word, stretched in order to make it into infrastructure so that you're actually really manipulating the architecture in a way to become infrastructure. And I, I don't know if you would want to comment on that or if you think that's an accurate uh, reading of the bridges between them, but it's pretty heroic sometimes what you've managed to accomplish by actually non-programmatic elements that uh, work in perspective. You know, your your questions are really interesting on your observation about stretch. I think it's something that we find ourselves inevitably trying to do because the confines of an architectural problem are often really limited formally, um, but the capacity of being able to engage larger terrains is super interesting. We've also found that nobody ever questions infrastructure engineering, and everybody questions design and architecture. And so being able to kind of take on the territory that remains unquestioned allows you to have incredible freedom and far more impact. So, someone paid us a great compliment, uh, they, referring to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. They said, well, your project is so much better than the photographs. Um, <laughs> and yeah, first you yeah, well, the photographs were bad. Um, <laughs> Um, but we took that as, uh, you know, well, I think anyone would take that as a compliment, but I think we like the idea that you can't quite tell where the building stops or where it starts in that sense. 
of indefiniteness is something I think is very intentional. <laughs> come on, Greg, you can come up with this tough question. The mock up of the, uh, of the glass structure um, out on the field. And um, how do you get to those levels of kind of uh, experimental uh, materials in institutional projects like that uh, without the hammer coming down on the conservative administration? Oh, you're referring to the Barnard project, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great question. Uh, sometimes you can leverage fear. Um, in the case of Barnard, they were very concerned about the community uh, with, uh, with good reason. You know, Columbia uh, in particular has had a very acrimonious history with the community. So the trustees were interested in not just doing a brick building, doing something a little different. But they were also very, very concerned about how the community would see the building. So we were able to kind of talk about glass as having a kind of chromatic relationship to its context rather than a material relationship. And only through lots of mock-ups, I think, were we able to not only test out the idea, but also convince folks in the community that this building would be situated in a respectful way. You know, I think one of the Thank things you. that happens with a kind of a glass uh, a glass building in a campus is that everybody's afraid of glass. <coughs> whoa, it's going to be too modern. You know, it comes from some groups and other people say, whoa, it's going to be too hot. You know, there's a whole lot of uncertainty around glass. So being able to do a lot of research over the course of the year in private in a way unsupported allowed us to state though within our specifications explicit requirements for mock-ups and by making a competitive bid and saying that those mock-ups must be embedded in the price and they cannot be elected actually eliminates a lot of the playing field and you end up with actually in scholars who want to do those mock-ups they know they've got to get it right so it's a you know it's some behind the scenes and then it embedded in the specs because nobody reads them but then you have control of the project because nobody reads them you know, these are <laughs> these are kind of important things. Um, this isn't really a question, maybe more of an appreciation. Having explored um, a number of these buildings that you've shown, um, what struck me and what seemed like a consistent theme running through them all was the fact that the geometries are complex and yet the ceiling that you get as you move through the space, feels inevitable, as though it was had to be that way. Whether it be the botanical garden or the ten um, uh, academic building or Hunter Park, um, and I wonder if that conceals a lot of iterations that you go through before you reach that final point. Um. Lots of arguments, uh, false starts, blind alleys. Yeah, I, 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 I thank you for uh, pointing that out. I think we would hope that the buildings, complex as they might be, seem effortless. Um, but I think we're reminded of something that's extraordinarily obvious. I mean, the great gift of architecture is how bodies relate to space. And uh, we uh, think have always been stimulated by um, artists or uh, filmmakers who really appreciate how you move through space. And I think uh, we're realizing, I suppose, after you know, several decades, how important and what a great gift that aspect is, that characteristic of architecture is. I think, though, you know, Michael, too, a huge thank you for you for actually going to those places. It's been actually great to have the conversation about it because. Um, I mean, for us, it, it is a lot of iterations, and it's just a ridiculous amount of time and a hell of a lot of really bad versions of it before it gets to something that we can't set aside. And 
in a sense, uh, Ralph Lerner, who was my professor, uh, had said, when in doubt, leave it out. And that's not a bad, a bad thing. It helps when you're saving money on a project. It helps when you try to add too many of your ideas all in one. And, and distilling it down to something more essential ends up being the thing that drives and, and brings it forward. Actually, uh, sometimes value engineering is not a bad thing. It, it's a, maybe more of an observation, but I just wondered if it's something that you strategically decided on. But when I think about the young architects in the 80s and 90s and the fixation on landscape and investing so much digital technology in the design of ground, um, and how most of those architects more or less our generation shifted to planning and design and you know Parchi and, and Jesse and Monaco and people like that. It seems like you stayed very dedicated to rethinking ground plan in a way that you didn't talk about that at all. But it, it seems like your work has flourished in that explosion of thinking about ground and landscape and surfaces which are really complex. So that sort of planning is very fine. But I wouldn't say it's it's straight up. Yeah. So I'm just curious if that was a strategic decision. I mean, it, it does also feel much more like human to think about the ground rather than the uh, thought. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's it's really interesting um, question or observation, and I would say much of it's intuitive, but also much of it's a territorial ambition. I mean, in a sense, architecture is a pretty finite thing. I mean, you, you can clad it, you can clad it, you can clad it. Um, but in a sense, once you start messing with the terrain and the territory and the topography, it's infinite in terms of how far you can reach and what you can impact and actually how much of a population you can invite into that terrain. So I would say that it's kind of the indefinite nature. Yeah, that's a great question. We've had this conversation with Stan Allen and some of the folks you have mentioned. Um, um, and um, some of it was actually luck. Um, you know, the Seattle project was a competition. We were competing with landscape architects and architects. Um, and um, it got built. So we really had to think very deeply about how the ground plan was made, which is very different from how it's drawn because it moves in ways that well, facades move too, but it moves in ways that are much less predictable. And after that, I think uh, we had the opportunity to work on Honey's Point with Arup and PBA and a whole bunch of other really talented, talented people. And there, uh, I think, Greg, the issue of impermanence became much more foregrounded. Uh, water does things that you can't quite control in ways that you can't quite predict. So I think it, some of it was just the luck of engaging in projects that demanded us to think that way. Great presentation, first of all. Uh, second, um, it seems like the uh, like the exper like the experiential aspect of each of these projects is like very important to you. So I'm wondering if you had like any like like surprising experiences that people have like told you about in these projects, like after they were built that you weren't expecting? We had one uh, uh, surprising thing. Uh, we were sitting on an airplane next to a guy flying over Seattle, and I was too embarrassed to say we designed this project, but I asked him what he thought about the Olympic Sculpture Park, and he said, my dog loves it. Um, <laughs> so take that as a compliment. Um, you know, it's a great question. I think our, our, our both our biggest hope and our biggest fear is that we're going to be surprised by how our buildings are used. There's usually that first month where I really do want to put all the garbage cans back where they're supposed to be, and I get all kind of obsessive, compulsive, pre-dinner party mode for about a month. And then it's kind of good to let it go, and then the kinds of exciting things happen when it's claimed and shaped in ways that we didn't expect. And um, you could argue that there have been too many weddings um, by the train tracks in Seattle for safety's sake. Uh, but there's been a kind of a, a kind of a, a hoopla that's been created on behalf of those folks who are getting married, and and also in the um, 
uh, Barnard project, too many people are putting things on the glass, but all of a sudden, um, four stacks of layers of glass with posters built up is a new collage of what you can see or not see. So, in a way, I think that um, once we sort of get over, uh, get over my dinner party prep mode, you know, the the kind of magic of things being done and redone, or nature taking over and showing things that grow and don't grow, gives us a kind of pause and maybe a chance to start again. I'm just asking, that's actually a really good question. I think um, you, we hope that our buildings are armatures um, that will invite use and participation. And there's some areas of the buildings that um, work more successfully than others. The stairs uh, that um, Marion shared on the nanotechnology building were seen initially uh, as really frivolous. But it turns out that the lab technicians and the scientists all gravitated because when you're working in a lab under very intense, very close, everything's foregrounded, the ability to get outside and, and get some distance um, was incredibly important and very uh, important to their health. So they became the biggest advocates and the heaviest users of what we thought was a slightly monumental uh, architectural gesture. Thank you.